Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 6, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Today's week of charts is brought to you by Traders for a Cause. Let me punch that up for you real quick. Today's show I'm gonna is gonna be a little bit abbreviated. I'm gonna do a we'll try to keep it to about one hour and we're just gonna look at the charts. In fact, if you'd like, you could actually start asking about stocks now if you want. And uh, we'll take a look at a few charts, take a look at the P's, take a look at the Russell, etc. Uh, anyway, the reason I'm doing that is because I have to fly out to Vegas. I've given um, a speech at Traders for a Cause conference. If you are in Vegas or nearby, stop by, and you can find more information at tradersforacause.com. All right, let's uh, hop right into it. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Uh, this week, again, let's just focus on the charts and then uh, your questions, obviously. Uh, when you ask about a stock, you can ask about as many as you want. Just ask it about one ticker and then hit enter. And that way I know which ones I've covered. All right. Let's take a look at the P's. Now, what's interesting about the S&P 500 is it's been down, it's up, it's 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 down. It's been kind of what I call a Jackie Mason market. Up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. So you got to be careful in a market like that not to chase your own tail. Now let's take a look at this again. One thing I like to look at is the debt-debt price change and go back in time. So if you look at the debt-debt price change, the market really hasn't gone a long ways on a net-net basis in a long long time so that's one of the most simplest forms of technical analysis is where are we and where were we looking back in time and if you could draw a big sideways arrow then you're going sideways now let's back the chart out a little bit to gain some perspective now some people often ask me well Dave the markets here and that it was way back here in 2015 well yeah Going off that net net change, it, it has gone sideways, and that is important. But I'm more interested in, in what it's done over the past several months. Or if you have a leg up like this, this is more important than the sideways action. Okay, so net net is important, especially when you're looking at the short term to intermediate term. But when you're going way way far out, the last leg is what you want to base. Uh, more, put more credits to or whatever the, what I'm trying to say there. In other words, we're still in this leg here until proven otherwise. Now, when you look at the sideways action in here, you can see we've kind of made this little base. The good news is we're on top of this prior base in here. So, so far, so good, but obviously you have to make it to new highs sooner or later. And the market has lost some steam in here by trading sideways. But as long as you're not too far away from all-time highs, as a trend follower, you should err on the side of the trend, the longer-term trend. In this case, it's up. Now, somebody pointed out that we did have a bow tie in the S&P 500. But what happened was it bow tied down. This is a daily chart. We're still in a daily. We're going to hop out to the weekly here in just one second. And obviously, we broke down out of this range, and that was a little concerning. But sometimes when you pop down out of a range, if you pop right back up, it's a bit of an all-clear, or not necessarily an all-clear, but it's not uh, as concerning as, in when you, as when you stay below the range. One cup of coffee next presentation, Dave. But what happened was it did bow tie, but the bow tie never really did trigger, or at least trigger in earnest. And the market popped right back up, and it looked like it was going to go back to make new highs, but obviously it didn't. And now it's kind of meandering in here. Now, it doesn't mean we can't get a second signal or something bad could happen, but this bow tie here, I wouldn't get too excited about that just yet. Don't completely ignore it, okay, but I wouldn't necessarily make a trade off of it in and of itself. Obviously, it's not a positive. I'm getting a ringing in my ear. Let me shut this down.
Okay. Now, if you look at a weekly chart, remember last summer I was all excited because we had a bow tie down. That is very concerning because the last 30 years, that was a pretty uh, serious signal. And we sold off a little bit from it. We had one little throwback. And then this look, kind of looked like the real deal here. But the market would write back up to make new highs. So, so far, so good. But it is a little scary when you look at it going all the way back to 2015. Okay. Because we really haven't taken out this peak decisively just yet. So, again, you know me. I sure would like to see new highs made decisively. In here. Sooner or later, this market will top out. That I can guarantee. Hopefully, it'll be later. I think I wrote a column last summer where I think Drucker Miller was uh, bearish too, and I was bearish. And I'm like, hey, we're both right. We're just early. <laughs> and the road, to, the road to ruin in markets is paid by being right but early. So what do you do? Well, you just follow along, and I was putting together some slides this morning for the uh, finishing up my slides for Traders for a Cause, and I noticed I had some slides left over from uh, February and January, and the portfolio was 100% short, or at least all of all of the stocks in the portfolio were short, so there were no longs. And it made me realize, oh, well, the market was headed lower earlier in the year. So you just follow along, but you don't necessarily make a big picture predict prediction or projection. But you do pay attention. So bigger picture wise, if we come back below this peak, which is only 2125, okay? So if we get around, let's just use 21 as round numbers. If we get down below 2100, then I would become more concerned about the market. But for now, let's back up to the S&P 500 to the short term chart. As long as we're not too far away from all-time highs, I'm not going to get too excited. Now, here's the deal. With a trend-following methodology, and the market starts chopping sideways like this, you're not going to see a whole lot of setups. The setups that we have seen recently have been in much more speculative issues that wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit them in the ass, such as IPOs, and they've done very well, knock on wood. But if you looked at a lot of your bigger cap issues, they're going to look a lot like the S&P 500. And stocks in general have been going sideways. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. The good thing about the NASDAQ is it did break above this prior little range in here. And so far, so good. It's holding, hanging in there. And it hit all-time highs not that long ago. But I sure would like to see it make some new, brand new highs and stick. As a momentum kind of guy, I'm a bigger fan or I'm more concerned about what the NASDAQ is doing than the S&P 500. It all matters, though. If the S&P starts tanking, then eventually it's going to take down everything with it. That I could guarantee. Let's take a look at the Russell. The Russell, you're back to a net-net problem. And you can go back all the way to roughly July. We're just kind of barely above this July range in here. And then you could argue that, well, you don't have to argue. You could just draw it. You're in a big longer-term range. So what's that, August, September, October, almost three months of sideways action. So that's a little concerning in here. Now, we're not too far away from multi-year highs, not all-time highs, but multi-year highs. And if you look a little further out, I have to fix the chart on this one. But if you look a little further out, you could see that, the Russell still has some longer-term highs to overcome. Let's see if we can get this in here. Maybe the next chart will have it. Let's see. If not, we'll just hop out to the real charts. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. So we still have to get past these longer-term highs and this longer-term range in here. We're almost there. We pushed into it. Okay, but just remember that anybody who buys doing a range like this, they're unhappy. They're happy as long as the market hangs in there, but they're unhappy when the market drops below. And then sometimes they may be inclined to get out, okay, when you push back into this range. So that's a little bit concerned, but there's not that much to go. We just have to make it, obviously, to do highs. So we need to pay attention to the situation, especially the Russell 2000, because that's a little bit more indicative other stocks we're going to trade. Now, I'm going to hop into the charts for um, for the other 
sectors and take a look at gold and bonds and all that other good stuff. But if you want to talk about some uh, stocks, feel free to do so. Uh, working on a beginner's course. Uh, this is going to take a while, looks like, but uh, it's coming along really nicely. I'm pretty excited about it. And I will be giving away um, quite a bit of that course once it does come out. And you see, you see a lot of, you've been seeing a lot of the slides over the past uh, several months in here uh, from that course. And what's kind of interesting, and it's something I've been talking about a little bit over the weekend at, at Traders for a Cause, is that going back in time to do that course, kind of imagining myself going back in time and, and talking to that young punk version of me, my main thing I would tell him is that, hey, you know what? Focus on the psychology of everything, then learn a little money management, and then just follow something simple instead of going on that holy grail hunt. Unfortunately, I think we all have to go on that holy grail hunt first and then finally reach the epiphany that simple is more is better than complex in that there are, there is no holy grail and life gets a lot easier. That's actually not a margin call. It's a trailing stop that's working. So that's a good thing. I don't know if you could hear that in the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'll be happy to get to those stocks. Uh, just keep them coming. Uh, by the way, uh, all the examples, obviously none this week, but uh, you go back in time of the past several years, nearly every example, that I use comes straight from the trading service. So make sure you're at least on a delayed service. And if you go to my homepage on my website, I think the easiest way to get to that, and again, I could probably, the website's still a work in progress, but we could, um, if you go to the getting started, I think you'll find it. Go to my homepage and then scroll down a little bit to get started right there. And then, Scroll down in here. There's a list of things to do. Yeah, there it is, number nine. So go to number nine under DaveLander.com, getting dash started. And make sure you're under delayed services so you can follow along. And then I've had a couple people actually come from uh, delayed over to real time because they were actually doing okay following the delayed. I wouldn't recommend you do that because you're going to be a little late on the signals. And to me, you're, um, what's the word? Trip it over nickels to get to the dollars. <laughs> Is that the word for it? Uh, without soft selling it, it's I, just go with the real time, obviously. But follow along to get a feel for things, especially if you, if you don't have enough money to trade. If you're not adequately capitalized, then don't wait until you have money to trade. Get educated and follow along. Please follow along for free. And uh, in the service, I try to make it a lot more than just a tip sheet. I try to give daily lessons as uh, applic applicable, easy for me to say, whenever there's a teachable moment on discretion or trailing stops or whatever the case may be, discretion, money management, psychology, be a patient, et cetera, all these things you hear me talk about weekly and uh, write about weekly, find their way into the service on a daily basis in real time. So uh, you follow along and on the late version. Uh, the only thing delay doesn't have is live commentary, and uh, that's useful. Once you, if you do sign up for the uh, real time, you can get all the co commentary archives, and that commentary is useful in that it's a lot of questions that are asked about live positions, uh, and, and that it's good to watch that unfold. So if you do get on, even if you just get a trial, you'll be able to download those comments. It's just too much. It's too much hassle to update two separate services. So that's why the delay doesn't have those uh, some of those real-time features in it. All right, let's hop out into the charts and uh, keep the keep the stock picks coming. That's great. I'm just going to take a look at a few things here. And we're going to try to keep the show under an hour today so I could uh, get out of town. But let's take a look at the – we just looked at the P's. Let's take a look at – the bonds first. Now bonds have been a bit in bid. Ugh, let me start over. Bonds have been in a bit of a slide as of late. And the thing about bonds or any other type of intermarket technical analysis, two things. One, it only matters when it matters, and this is especially true in today's day and age. When I first got started back in the 90s. 
the intermarket technical analysis worked a lot better, and you could almost count on it. You could almost trade one market off another one. In fact, I've got some book over here. I'm trying to think who wrote it. Or I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but that's all I did to trade S&P futures was they they watched the ticks and the bonds, and they scalped the S&P futures. I don't think you could do that anymore. It only matters when it matters. When the markets are correlated or inversely correlated, whatever the normal, the quote unquote normal relationship is, that's the only time it actually matters. The second thing is that, especially with something like bonds, the delta is more important than the actual levels. So right now, everybody's been skittish, and they've been skittish for a couple of years that rates are going up. And rates are going to eventually go up. Um, I don't read a lot of the commentaries, but I do skim some headlines now and then. And I've seen a lot of headlines that talk about how what's happened is unprecedented with these artificially low rates. And it's going to end badly. And I agree, it's going to end badly. But hey. Maybe the market will die another day, and that would be just fine with me. But the delta is what's important. In other words, the change. And you can see that drops bonds drop pretty hard in here recently, which means rates are going up. Bonds down, rates up. But here's the deal. We're only right around where we were, where back in September about three weeks ago. So rates aren't that much higher now than they were. And again, one day this low interest rate environment is going to end. Uh, with these or let me just check the highs. I think that's all-time all highs. Yeah, we're just coming off of all-time highs in bonds. So I would definitely encourage you to pay attention to the weekly bow tie in bonds. And you can see these moving averages are beginning to turn a little bit. And by the way, just a quick teachable moment here. Uh, Greg Morris taught me this. Whenever a close, whenever a market closes below an exponential moving average, that moving average will automatically turn down. So you can see right here, close below, moving average turned down. It's hard to see, but it did. And it's a little bit more obvious in the 20-day. And right here, you can see obvious turn down. So that's why the bow tie works. It's because it catches up to the market quickly. I still like a 10 period simple moving average just because I like to know what the market's doing on a true basis over the shorter term. But I do like the exponential averages because they weight, they front rate, front weight the data. So keep it on these bow ties. When the 10 gets below the 20 and the 20 gets below the 30, I would become a little bit more concerned about rates. Okay. And you can see shorter term. So far, they still look a little toppy in here. So bonds are a bit of a concern, obviously. Now, if you take a look at real estate, specifically the REITs, the REITs have really woken up to the fact that bonds could be in trouble. Now, there might be some other factors, too. But it sure looks like, based on the action here and in utilities, which are these areas are very interest rate sensitive. So both these areas have sold off hard. We both had a little throwback in here, a little what they call a throwback rally. Sometimes you get to sell off, you get that sharp last little gasp higher, and it goes right back in. Donald, I can't talk about that one because it's on the service for today, but good eye. <laughs> um, now let's take a look at some of the other sectors in here. First of all, with the NASDAQ, not too far from all-time highs, some of these areas like technology, as you would expect, are doing fairly well because NASDAQ, as you know, is a better or truer representation of uh, technology than like the S&P 500. It's one way of looking at it is S&P 500 is kind of like old school and the NASDAQ 100 is more new school, more technology, more gee whiz and those type of things. And the S&P 500, a little bit more brick and mortar type of things going on there. But you can see the semis have done fairly well in here, broken out above their prior little consolidation in here. So far, so good there. Some areas like Internet also doing fairly well in here. So for the most part, technology doing fairly well. 
there's internet in here. But again, I'm not seeing a lot of setups with the choppy sideways action. It's it's a very selected type of market where only selected technology, and specifically lately the IPOs have been uh, doing very well in here. Some of these areas like regional banks doing okay, banging out new highs in here. Nothing to really get excited about there. Occasionally we, we might short some of these areas, but usually on the long side they don't really offer that great of opportunities. Uh, some areas still look like they could be troubled here, like retail. Retail did a bow tie down on the daily chart. Let's check the weekly. The weekly is kind of coming in here, and this does look a little toppy. In fact, hopefully this is not a microcosm of the S&P 500. And I'm not a big fan of the pattern, but you could argue that this could be the three peaks in a dome pattern or something like that. Depends on how you want to count the peaks. Maybe four peaks in a dome. Let's count them here. Let's count one, two three and then you get the dome top let's go back to the s p 500 i'm just kind of seeing this in real time yeah uh same sort of action going on there too could that could be concerning because you get one two three and then you get the dome um it's not that i'm not a fan of the pattern it's something that you can't actually trade but it's certainly something that's worth paying attention to. So kind of looking at the S&P 500 on a weekly basis or a longer term basis, I should say, it is a little bit concerning in here. So we want to see new highs. We want to see this happen sooner rather than later because it is a little sideways longer term. Now let's take a look at what else is happening in here. Some of these areas like drugs are not looking so hot, at least on a daily basis. You can see that they rallied up and then they kind of rolled back over. So it's kind of mixed out there. It depends on where you look and what you see. But that could change quickly as long as the market can, if, if the market goes on to make new highs. Uh, transport's kind of hanging in there, just uh, shy of these multi-year highs. They still have a ways to go to get back to new highs, though. Uh, railroads within transports have been doing fairly well. I'm not sure we're going to find any setups there because of the lower volatility stocks, but it is worth paying attention to. And as I often say, you need to pay attention to everything. Metals of mining had some recent weakness to it. They do look a little sideways in here, but they're coming off of they're still coming off of major major lows, which they bottomed out obviously in earlier uh, early 2016, earlier this year is what I'm trying to say. The reason I'm not going to rush out and short them is because. It doesn't look like a major opportunity. I'm more excited about the bottom that they made earlier this year than them going back down to their old lows. Gold and silver have been whacked pretty bad in here within the metals, and that's probably what's dragging down the whole sector. Um, somebody asked me, is the is the uptrend ending in gold? I don't know. It, it might be. Uh, or they might just be coming down to consolidate and, and make a new bottom. But if you take a look at gold and silver, like metals and mining in general, they were coming off of major, major lows. Let's take a look at a weekly in here. You can see major lows of 2016. On a weekly chart, so far it's just kind of retracing that rally up. I wouldn't rush out and buy them, but I also wouldn't rush out and short them because it looks like at the worst they'll just come down and challenge their prior lows in here. But one day at a time, let's just see how things shake out. Maybe if some individual stocks are coming off of major, major highs, then maybe I'll look to short, and that's just how I play things, again, one day at a time. But for now, I'm not seeing anything that's that I want to rush out and short, at least just yet, in gold. But if you're long on your stops, okay, let's take a look at gold to commodity real quick. GLD. GLD broke down out of, the, out of its range. So that scores is a bit of a bummer, but it does have another range here where it might find some support. And like everything else, metal-wise, it looks like the old lows is probably where it would probably find some support, if not sooner. So I'm not seeing anything I want to rush out and short just yet in the gold. So in general, sector action is kind of mixed. If you take a look at something like health services, kind of like the P sideways and selling short of its prior highs, looks a little worse than the P's. But for the most part, most areas that are older, established areas, such as health service and some of these other uh, brick and mortar or possible brick and mortar areas, 
they're going to look a lot like the S&P 500, mostly kind of sideways. All right, let's open it up for these stocks in here. Uh, Donna wants to know about CLD. CLD looks good. It's considered a metal in mining. Mining is that a, is it a, a coal stock or what? What do they do? Anybody know? We're long C and X, and that's I think that's a coal stock. But CLD looks pretty good. Yeah, Brett, that one's on my list for today too. So I'm not going to talk about that one, but good eye on that one. Good job on that one. CLD looks good. It's going to have to pull back, though, because it's had a pretty serious rally in here. But on pullbacks, absolutely. Uh, good eye on that one. That should be – put that in your momentum list, okay? Thanks, Dave. How about a bow tie on rate? Steve. All right, let's take a look at that. Well, it's a little choppy, and you've got this big gap down here. Then you've got all this trading over here. With a bow tie, I like to have a little clearer air. CNX is a good example. This is one I've been putting in my slides for the upcoming presentation. I talked about this one last week. You could see you had this drop here in CNX, but you didn't really have a bunch of overhead supply until way up here at 30 bucks a share, which would be a good problem to have. And you could see the bow tie that came in right here. You had nice clear air, and you didn't really have any issues to worry about, okay? Whereas the bank rate, you got this big wad of resistance right up here, which I know would be a good problem to have. But before you even get there, you got a big gap. And then if you come here, you've got some overhead supply. So it is a bow tie off of multi-year lows. And is that all-time lows? Let's see. Yeah, that's all-time lows. So that's usually a good pattern to trade as a general statement. But one thing that I've been talking about, over the past several years, and that's why I finally got around to doing a course on it, the stock selection course, is that the pattern's important and the setup's important, but you also have to pay attention to what's actually going on in the chart. And your stock selection is crucial too. I remember when I first got started, I was helping someone with their trading service early on, and I'd say, hey, well, here's your pattern. And they were like, no, it's not. And I'm like, yes, it is. And, and, and they said, no, it's not. And then we went back and forth a few times, and finally I showed him, I took his rules out. I pointed to the chart. I showed him exactly where it was his pattern. He goes, okay, well, fine, but I don't like it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that made more sense to me. I mean, back then, back then I was kind of searching for that mechanical holy grail, and I thought it existed. And it made me realize that it doesn't, and a little discretion makes all the difference in the world. So, yeah, it's a bow tie. I hear you, but it's got a lot of overhead supply, and it's got some issues. So I would leave that one alone, along with an answer on that. Sorry about that. Uh, Brett wants to know about Novin. Would this, been, would this have been considered a first pullback? Novin, good questions today. Yeah, this is, a, this is obviously uh, an IPO, and this is on my radar. But, yeah, that's, that looks pretty good. Uh, be careful. A little on the thin side. But, yeah, this looks pretty good. This is a, what I'd call a first pullback in an IPO, a first deep retracement or beginning becoming a deep retracement. Uh, any IPO, sometimes they take off and they have a really deep retracement. This isn't necessarily a pattern I would trade an individual stock. But in IPOs, there are some – I bend the rules a little bit, and I like these deep retracements in IPOs, the first deep, deep retracement, first pullback, however you want to look at it. But, yeah, that's a good-looking stock, absolutely. High five on that one, okay? Good job, Brett. Donna wants to know about TTD, TTD, TTD. Uh, well, no. <laughs> um, we like things that go up. So far, it's going down. So – for me to get interested in this stock at this juncture, it would have to make new highs and then pull back. Now, sometimes with IPOs, and I, I, I can't think of an example on the fly, but I know they're out there, and I know we've traded them in service. Sometimes an IPO, they come public too high. As I've said in the course, I call it the fly and die. Sometimes they come public. And if they, they come public too high, they, they die. So the underwriters or whoever bring them public here, and they just kind of die out. But it, if they go for months and months and months and months and then begin to rally, 
over here, that first little transitional pattern, that bow tie, that first thrust or whatever, that could be a beautiful thing to trade. And I'm not as worried about the bad memories, such as overhead supply, because a lot of that gets washed out of the system really quick. You have a lot of eager beavers, I guess, so to speak, a lot of people back here. And they're looking to they're looking to get off the hook as quickly as possible. And some of them might have some hold up times. They might have to hold it so long. Um, anyone who who buys an IPO, let's say you get allocated some IPO shares. Well, if you flip them out right away, the chances of you getting new shares are going to be less likely. So you do kind of have to take the good with the bad. I know a, a trader, he used to own a brokerage, I think, um, and he made a lot of money in his brokerage, and he's a very wealthy individual, and he gets shares of all IPOs, and he was like, oh, yeah, I got whatever the hottest one at the time was. And it was up tremendously. He goes, yeah, but I get a lot of dogs too. And he said, the moment I start flipping them out – is the moment that I'm going to stop getting allocated IPOs. So you do have a lot of people that are looking to get off the hook, especially if it begins to dive like this, okay? So IPOs are kind of a little bit different creature in certain ways. The bad news is you don't have the trading history to know how they're going to act, at least early on when you're trading those pioneer patterns like the one we just looked at. But the good news is there are some things that occur because you got a lot of people over here looking to get off the hook. And that supply works its way through the system fairly quickly. So when they finally do get their act together, that first little transition, you might want to write that down, is worth uh, trading on an IPO. Okay. Jerry's waiting patiently for TCK. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate you waiting. Now, this is a metals and mining company. My only problem with initiating new metals and mining outside of possibly energy ones. Oh, I forgot to look at energy. We'll take a look at that in one second. Uh, so find out what they do. See if they're, it says industrial. See if it's coal or something because it might trade like a little bit of a different animal. Uh, as I look at this chart, the first thing kind of jumps out of me when I back it out is overhead supply. Now, you're probably thinking, Dave, that's a couple of years ago. Well, markets sometimes have long memories. So you can't completely discount this overhead supply, even though it goes back three years or so. Um, it looks okay. But if you start to kind of pick it apart a little bit, if you look at the net net change, uh, based on the volatility, the HV is 55 on this. And I have all these formulas if you need them. Just let me know. Uh, specifically for telechart. If you do an internet, and I got them off the internet to begin with. My pullback scan, I wrote myself, and then somebody actually, uh, I think somebody simplified it. But for the most part, the form of those, I, I initially got them off the internet, especially for something like HV. And uh, so you can get it off the internet too, but if you need it, I'll give it to you. But based on the HV, this stock has gone pretty much sideways for quite a while. In fact, if you connect the high in here, it's almost completely sideways. So even though it did kind of get above this little range, it has lost some steam in here as of late. So it would have to accelerate higher and then pull back. But then I'm framed that within the fact that it does have some of that longer term overhead supply. So that would concern me a little bit. Okay. Jerry wants to look at light also, L-I-T-E. Yeah, now this is, a, this is much better looking as far as a trend. In fact, you can see my little blue arrow in there from last week. And then it's also accelerating in its trend. That other one is kind of decelerating in its trend. Okay, let's get a clean chart in here and take a look at that. So it's still in a decent trend, but it's sort of lost some steam as of late. You can see it's kind of – and then if you put the moving averages back in, you can see the moving averages are beginning to lose a little steam too and go sideways. To, to lower. In fact, as I just said, remember when the price crosses below those moving averages, what happens? The exponential ones, at least, the moving averages turn down. So let's go back to 
uh, Lumentum. And you can see in this particular case, it's actually beginning to accelerate higher. It's also a very persistent stock. It tends to go up day after day after day after day. So when this one makes a TKO, especially because it's what I call a toddler, it's still a relatively new issue with some excitement to it. If this one makes the mother of all TKOs, you need to be all over it. So this needs to be in your momentum watch list. Okay. So good eye on that one, Jerry. CLVS. Somebody told me I'm... I'm I beat them up too much. It's like, well, I'm trying to get you to pick the best stocks, okay? It sometimes means I have to beat you up. Uh, this one, let me just make sure there's no split problem. Uh, no, uh, I don't like stocks that have big gaps down like this. So I don't know what happened, but that's pretty crazy. So I would pass on it based on that. But if I was just seeing this charted here, I'd like to see a little bit more pullback because it ran from – like 12 and change, it's almost, what, 300% in here? No, nope, 170%, 200% round numbers, okay? So I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move, but I would probably pass, unless I did some research, to make sure this is legitimate back here. I do occasionally back up my charts with this, or, or back up what I'm seeing in the charts by looking at, uh, like, stockcharts.com. I have an account there also. LN. Yeah, this one looks okay. This is one I've been watching. It, it has pulled back to this prior little high in here, which I'm a little bit more lenient with IPOs. I'll, I'll give this one, certainly give this one an okay. In an ideal world, I would have felt better if it had cleared that prior base uh, more decisively, that prior peak, okay? Okay, NTGR, that sounds like, is that the old Netgear? It sure is. Um, yeah, this looks kind of interesting. It's had quite the run in here. My only problem is it did look like it kind of lost some steam in here. Let's back the chart out a little bit. It looked like it lost momentum in this run, but it did run higher. Bit of a double top knockout. I'm going to give this one an okay. And the beauty of this one is that maybe you have a trigger way up here. It's likely not going to trigger. It's either the end of the trend or the mother of all knockouts. The only thing I don't like about it, I guess I probably wouldn't take it the more I look at it now because it just kind of looks like looks like it lost some momentum in here. Uh, but it's okay. It's not bad. If you did take it, have an entry up here because if it can make it all the way back up here, then you might have the mother of all trend, trends resuming. And that's the beauty of the TKO. In fact, if you guys bear with me, I'll pull up my slides for the um, – let's see if I can do this on the fly. Yeah, it might not have time. But the beauty of the TKO is a lot of times you get a TKO and they never trigger and the stock continues to implode. So this looks like a case where that might be happening. CLVS, Sam, you're next. Yeah, this is one I'm watching uh, shorter term. No, this is what longer term. I'm getting this confused with something else. Yeah, what I said earlier about this was shorter term, it looks okay. A little bit more knockout, move, a little more pullback necessary, but longer term, you got that overhead supply. I need to start deleting these. Uh, a couple of people, two people asked for that one. That's why it came up. PTGX for Mr. Brett. PTGX. Yeah, I mean, this needs to be on your watch list, and it's on my watch list. It's a little thin, though, so watch to make sure it's, it's thick enough to trade. But it looks like it could set up as a double top knockout soon. So if this thing pulls back, let's say maybe even like 16, that would be a good looking stock. You got your stock picking is getting much better in here, by the way. A E G R is this too too much? A E G R. 
the question is, is this too big a move up? Well, it's a speculative issue, obviously. Your HV is up here around 100, and it is a lower price stock, okay? But it does have that longer-term bottoming look to it, so uh, not so much that it's too much of a move up. I'd like to see a lot more knockout move in here, maybe down to 240 or so. Keep in mind that that's a super speculative issue. Uh, when you're getting close to 100 on HV, it gets a little dangerous. Uh, we have uh, pi in the portfolio now, which the volatility increased tremendously, but it is getting a little bumpy in the portfolio because you're getting these big swings in here. 6% so far today. It's probably a similar move down yesterday. So that's the only problem with some of these more speculative issues. SRAQ, that's going to be that silver acquisition thing or something. SRAQ, I don't understand what this company is. Silver Run Acquisition Company. I actually Googled it, or YouTube, what's it, uh, Yahoo has a pretty decent finance, and I couldn't make heads or tail what it is. It, they, they had no, it's like a shell company or something. Not that I worry about what a company does, but I'd be a little concerned in this particular case because you can't, you at least want to be able to put it into a sector, to where you could say, oh, it's a gold stock, it's a silver stock, it's a energy company or a REIT or whatever. But I'm not sure what to make of this one. But maybe if it could accelerate higher or maybe just even pull back in here, we could reevaluate it. NVIDIA on a pullback. Let's take a look at that. Um, the only problem with the pullback on this one is we didn't clear this prior base in here that decisively. So it is pretty thick stock. Not that I wouldn't trade something this thick. So if it begins to pull back, you could end up back into this prior base. I, I, it looks okay. Maybe keep that on your momentum list. But I think there might be something better you could find out there to get in at this juncture. AGX. Yeah, put this on your momentum list. It's not set up right now. It's also thin, okay? So for an IPO, I'd be okay with, with the meat a little thinner. Once they've been become established, I'm a little bit more concerned about when they're like, like this uh, thin. So as a private trader, you can certainly still take it. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, possibly. We'll, we'll know it when we see it. WB for John. The only thing that's kind of jumping out at me on this one is that we really didn't clear this prior peak in here just yet. So it would actually have to break out to new highs and then pull back. But it certainly has been a pretty good Darvis style stock, hasn't it? Uh, it's been pretty cool. It's kind of gone up, consolidated, gone up, consolidated, gone up, consolidated, gone up, consolidated. It's kind of like our CNX has been doing, which is kind of cool. And obviously, it's it's more fun when you get into stock and they go straight up. But I'd actually rather be in a stock and have them go up, consolidate, go up, consolidate in the Darvis style. Uh, if you haven't read the book, it's worth reading. How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market by Darvis. Uh, if you had a magical way of identifying the Darva stocks ahead of time, I think you could own the world. And I would encourage you to, to look into that. But obviously that would be a grail hunt. My only way to do it is to trade my patterns and have them turn into a Darva stock. For instance, in this particular case, we had a bow tie in the CNX. And so far it's turned into a Darva stock. Consolidate, thrust, consolidate, thrust, consolidate. Darvis traded what he called boxes, meaning that he'd wait for a stock to move from one box or sideways consolidation to the next. And there's a lot of people that have kind of uh, taken the ball and run with that or taken the ball and ran with that. Anybody want to correct me on that? I have a Grammarly account, though. So if you notice, my grammar is getting better. <laughs> it's not me. It's the account. 
Um, Darvis got – it's kind of an interesting story. I don't want to spoiler alert you, but it's, it's not that exciting. But he, he was a dancer traveling the world, and uh, this one particular company couldn't pay him, so they paid him in stock. And he became fascinated with uh, trading stocks, and he would get telegrams from all over the world. It was a, with uh, stock quotes, and that was his system. Kind of the first uh, public, or very, or one of the first very public technical analysis type of things. Conceptually, it makes sense. CC, uh, CC, yeah, it looks good. You got a little acceleration higher. You got some persistency, uh, but what do we need? We need a pullback. Okay. Take the ball and run with it, according to Craig. Maybe, maybe I can get Craig involved in some of my projects. <laughs> I had someone who was uh, an editor. He was an editor for his wife's books, and uh, he's really good. I haven't heard from him in a while. Hopefully he's still out there. SREQ, yeah, we talked about that one. Not sure what it is. I'll have to Google it. Or YouTube, what is it? Yahoo it. MSCC for Sam. Uh, did we talk about this one? It looks kind of sideways. If you look at semis in general, let's take a look at the SMH. I haven't looked at that in a while. Uh, well, SMH even looks a little bit better than the MSCC. So with it sideways like this, you want to wait for it to break out to new highs and then look to play pullbacks along the way. It's fairly thick. You might be able to find something thinner in the semis. TTWO is a possible long. All right, let's take a look at that for Mr. John. TTWO. Nice longer term trend. A little choppy in the trend. Um, my only concern is it's just kind of choppy in the trend. And But Dave, it looks like a Darvish stock. It does. I agree. But for me to get on, it would have to break out the new highs and then pull back. Also, if you take a look at the HV, it's a little light at 21. What's the NASDAQ right now? NASDAQ's pretty low, too, though. Um, NASDAQ's at 11. But usually around 20 or so on the HV. I'm not that excited about trading a stock. Unless it's something like GoGo Nomo, which you can get from um, my website under free reports where you have a, a stock that has, I don't want to say I'm factoring fundamentals into it, but having fundamentals helps <laughs> because the stock is judged not just by uh, the promise of the future, but more about the actual reality. And uh, those stocks tend to fall fairly hard when they do fall. You're welcome, Sam. O C L R for Mr. Donald. O C L R. Shorter term, it's consolidating in here. Uh, it needs to be in your momentum list, obviously. It's pretty thick, so you could trade it, obviously. But it, based on the momentum, the momentum, it, I wouldn't necessarily throw a stock out because it's real thick if it's especially if it's trending. Uh, but we're going to have to see what happens. Maybe it could possibly do a double top knockout, but you want to see some sort of pullback or knockout in here. At this point, a pullback would look kind of funny. I'm not sure it would set up properly. Maybe some sort of knockout move would set up like a, a double top knockout. Jimo, did we talk about that one yet? Jimo. Yeah, this one looks good. A little bit of a gap. Um, I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout move. The gap is kind of small, so I would go ahead and, and give it a pass based on that. I would almost like to see just a tiny bit more knockout move, but it looks okay. You could certainly do a lot worse than that. So I don't know who gave me that one, but um, Donald, that was you. Good uh, good job. Uh Personally, and I guess since I'm talking, it would be my personal opinion anyway, I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout move, but obviously you don't want to see it come all the way back down to this prior base. But you could certainly do a lot worse. It looks okay. Maybe your entry is above the gap, so let the stock prove that it could fill the gap 
if you're thinking about uh, being serious about that. Okay. Okay, any more? While at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your schedule to be here. Uh, next week we'll go back to our regularly scheduled show. All right, Jim, NPTN, NPTN. Did we talk about this one? Yeah, it seems like we talked about this one. Let's see how many days in the pullback. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's getting a few too many days in the pullback. It looks okay. Uh, it did clear. Looks like I had a line drawn in here from weeks past. It looks okay, but it would have to trigger within a couple days because you're getting quite a few days of the pullback. Okay. So I'd say if it doesn't trigger within a few days, I would keep it on your momentum list, but go ahead and take it off your, your possible uh, trading list. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I appreciate, again, you guys and girls showing up. Uh, any other answer questions, David, Dave, Lander com. Be patient with me because I will be traveling this weekend, so it might not be until next week to get back with you, but uh, I will be on screen uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, any other answer questions, again, shoot me the email. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk again, and then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.